Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, nice to people see... Why don't we try that again? Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see people signed in and tuning in, etc., and participating in this online lecture. Of course, there is no requirement that anybody participate in a lecture synchronously, but I hope you find it useful and helpful and valuable to engage during the lecture with the top hat exercises and things and with me, but also with your classmates. Hopefully you have met a few people during the lab and things, but of course you don't have the opportunity to meet everybody in the class all at once. So hopefully it's a useful thing to be able to chat with people online, etc. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions that are coming in already. So there's a question about Lab 5. I'm going to defer the questions about the labs to our lab instructor, to Ms. Hogan. We had to change a few things because, well, we had that day that there was weather and people weren't able to do the lab, etc. So I'm going to let you ask those questions to her. And her email address is, again, lehogan at mun.ca. And she is completely in charge of the lab schedule. We talk about things and, and bounce ideas off each other and stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, whatever she says about the lab is what goes. So... Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, so a few people had some issues with assignment two, um, and in particular, so lots of people were able to submit an assignment two that just passed all the tests. There were, however, a few students who have emailed me, and I've responded to some of you. Unfortunately, I'm still a little behind on emails. Things have been a little crazy. Um, but there have been a few students who submitted code that, <clears throat> that works, but the auto grader didn't recognize that, for example, your green box, it expected to see a green box, it got a green box, but the Unicode character for your green box was not exactly the same representation as the Unicode character for the green box that was expected. This is one of the complexities, and so previously um, I presented to you the idea of the old ASCII encoding and the new Unicode encoding, and how the old ASCII encoding was really kind of exclusive in some ways, because it didn't let people use lots of different languages, and so, well, that was kind of silly. Now we have Unicode, which allows people to use all kinds of characters from all kinds of languages, and even things like emoji. However, Unicode is really complex, and there are lots of different ways to represent a character. So there is one way of representing, which is just a huge number that can range from like 0 to 4 billion, in the same way that ASCII would have represented characters by representing them with a number 0 through 127. Well, Unicode can have a whole lot more characters, but there are actually different ways of representing Unicode, and it's all a bit complex. So it is possible that some students submitted an assignment to that actually works just great, but the auto grader didn't recognize it because there's one way of encoding the little green square that your software happened to use, and there's another way of encoding the little green square that the auto grader chose to use. But that's not your fault. So I have started investigating exactly what's going on there and if there's a better way that we can do some of these comparison things. So if you got a mark on the auto grader that is much less than you thought, and it says things like, your code printed green square, gray square, gray square, gray square, gray square, I expected it to print green square, gray square, gray square, gray square, gray square, then you're in that category of people for whom I'm investigating the situation and I will try to fix it. Um, if we discover issues after I fix the auto grader, then a few people might need a little bit of time to resubmit something because now you might see actual bugs in your code. So we'll figure that out once I fixed the auto grader. Uh, I will also make an, a real effort to get to the rest of those emails, not right after this because we have a departmental meeting and not after that because then I have an admissions meeting and not after that because then I have another special meeting concerning admissions, but at some point, and then I will hopefully see my family for a little bit, but anyway, at some point I am going to try to get those emails responded to. Okay, uh, so we have a question here in the chat. Are you going to open function call topic questions as homework? Yes, yes, I will. So I will open the questions from Monday and today as homework to be due on Friday. And if I forget any by the end of today, then do send me an email and say, excuse me, could you please open this question and this question for me? And as just kind of a note to everybody. I've explained this to a couple of people as you emailed me, but the way that I see top hat questions and the way that you see top hat questions is different. So actually, 
it, it doesn't help if somebody says, I was sick last week. Can you give me all the questions that you asked on this day, this day, or this day? That, that actually doesn't help me find the questions, because to me, it's just a huge list of questions broken down by topic, not by date. So if you were sick on a particular day or something, then you can send me an email and say, could you please open this question and this question and this question by name? and then I can do it for you. That said, the top hat things are each low stakes enough that hopefully if people missed a lecture here or there, I'm happy to open the questions for you, but you shouldn't feel the pressure like, oh, I, I absolutely have to. Probably what I will end up doing is at the end of the semester saying, well, look, if somebody got 90% of the top hat questions, that's good enough for me. So I'll kind of almost mark it on a curve, as it were, because you know, everybody can miss a question here or there. Okay, so let's see. Uh, someone said the same issue with assignment one. So assignment one and assignment two are different in that assignment two didn't expect you to produce anything with funny Unicode characters like green boxes and yellow boxes and such. But I can definitely look into it. Oh, and I learned, by the way. Uh, so apparently Wordle actually has different color schemes depending on your, or I don't know if it's Wordle or if my if it's my dad's phone, but my dad, in an adaptation to color blindness, when he plays Wordle, he sends out text messages that have orange and blue squares. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, accessibility is a huge issue in computing because we don't want to produce software that only works for people who are just like us, where whether people being just like us means um, people who speak the same language as the programmer or people who see things the same way as the programmer or et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't want to produce a user interface where there's a really critical distinction between a green color and a red color when some people can't see the difference between green and red. So accessibility is a huge issue in computing and things like even providing alternate text for images so that people using screen reader software can see what it is you're talking about. All these kinds of things are helpful. Okay, uh, someone says, I just copied the Unicode from the assignment tab. Yeah, so it can depend on sort of a combination of your browser and the text editor that you were using to create that. So yeah, there, there's complexity. I'm going to try to figure it out so that we can be a bit more permissive and say whether you're using the UTF-8 UTF encoding, the UTF-16 encoding, uh, or the UTF-32 encoding, it will accept any of them. And so I'm going to try to fix the auto grader to do that. Someone says, will you be looking at the assignments yourself or is it just the mark from the auto grader? So I do look at the assignments when I'm trying to like figure out an issue with the auto grader, but the mark that you get at the end of the day is the mark from the auto grader. Now, if there's something wrong with the auto grader, then I will fix it. That's, that's my fault, not your fault. If you follow the specification and you did what you're supposed to do, then it's not your fault that the auto grader is wrong. So if something's wrong with the auto grader, I will fix it or I'll make every effort to fix it. And, and if I can't fix some particular thing, then well, we'll do something that doesn't penalize you for the sake of the auto grader being pickier than it should have been. The auto grader is extremely picky. And like 98% of the time, that's really good. But probably 2% of the time, it might be pickier than it's supposed to be because either some combination of I didn't anticipate, oh, a student could answer the question in that way, which is legit, or alternatively, because of an issue like this Unicode thing. Yeah, I had this feeling in the pit of my stomach when I was like, oh, it'd be so cool to have these colored squares instead of just like asterisks and exclamation marks or whatever. But I was like, yeah, this could come back to bite me. There's going to be some funny Unicode issue. And it worked when I tested it, and it worked when other people tried it. But yeah, yeah I should have listened to that uh, voice in the pit of my stomach. Okay, uh, let's see. So auto grader equals dummy. Uh, yeah, so the auto grader is extremely pedantic, and sometimes that's right and sometimes it's not. So if there is a particular issue and you've already emailed me, I will get back to you. If you haven't emailed me yet, then do send me an email so that I can know that yeah, you there's a particular issue there. I do know, for example, with assignment one, there wasn't the same Unicode issue, but there was a place where I expected you to give a certain prompt, and I said, you should prompt with this exact string, that said, I probably shouldn't penalize you on 18 of the 20 tests because your prompt was wrong. I should probably penalize you on one or two. So that's another issue that I may have to go back and revisit. Uh, if the auto grader grades me zero, but my code works perfectly, do I get my entire grade? So 
If the algorithm gives you zero, then I would encourage you to rethink the second part that your code works perfectly. So whenever we are designing engineered systems, whether it's a physical system, an electrical system, a computer system, the thing that ultimately things need to line up with is a specification. So when I give an assignment, that's like a specification, right? Um, and if you say, well, you know, the building design looked good to me and there was nothing wrong with it, but if it didn't support the load that the specification said it needed to support, well, then it wasn't perfect and it wasn't okay and it wasn't good. It didn't meet the specification. So in all of, in almost any kind of engineered system, really, there are three things, three artifacts that we really have to care about. There's a specification, there's the implementation, and then there's some kind of conformance testing. And so your code needs to follow the specification. One way that I check to see whether it follows the specification is through the use of this autograder, which does conformance testing. Now, if the tests are off from the spec, then the test should be fixed. If your code is off from the spec, your code should be fixed. How do we determine that something is off? Well, by looking at the code and the tests. And as of yet, there isn't really a good way to automatically generate perfect tests for a specification. Unless the specification is written in such a way that basically people can't read it, then only computers can read it. And that's actually an ongoing subject of research in the field of software engineering. Um, but yeah, so if your code doesn't pass the tests, then either your code is wrong or the tester is wrong. In a lot of cases, what we've seen with assignment one and assignment two, well, with assignment two, we've seen instances where the tester is actually wrong, where it ought to accept a certain green square, but it doesn't. So that's a problem with the autograder. I'm going to fix it. In some cases, we've seen places where the autograder is not wrong, but maybe it's being a little pickier than we want. So I'm going to see if I can find a way to adjust that a bit. All right, so uh, there are lots and lots of questions coming in about like, all right, so in people's specific questions about your specific assignment, um, if you have an issue with your specific assignment, then do send me an email and we'll and I'll try to get back to you about it. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yeah, okay. So again, if there's an issue with your specific assignment, send me an email because I, I'm. this is a good place for me to address questions that might um, have to do with everybody's work or a large percentage of the class. This is not a good place for me to address individuals. So I'll try to do that. Okay, so let's get on to what we are talking about today. Oh, okay, this is a general thing. How does the auto grader judge complexity? So that is using a metric of complexity that comes from actually the Python standard library where you can say, how complex is this um, abstract syntax tree, which is a way of representing source code. And uh, interestingly, so people are on that leaderboard for having the least complex. And so in general, the if you can solve the same problem with uh, less complexity with l simpler software, that's a better solution. So we want our code to be as complicated as it needs to be, and no more. That said, uh, that leaderboard isn't everything because some of the folks who are on that leaderboard actually their solution uh, didn't get all the marks. So yeah, uh, it, it's interesting to be able to to rank and to see who's able to provide a solution that's more complex than others or less complex than others. And, and that can be kind of a fun thing to participate in. Uh, but you know, bear in mind that your marks don't come from that because your solution may actually be incorrect. You could have something that is just an empty script file and it will say there's a very low complexity here, but that doesn't mean that it works correctly. Okay, so last time we were together, we were talking about functions. We talked about the semantics of functions, both functions and calls, and also how we define functions. So how we create functions. We talked about the syntax for defining functions. We kind of revisited very, very briefly the syntax for calling functions, an identifier, parentheses, and arguments inside the parentheses, which are separated by commas. But we also talked about how to create functions. And we talked about function parameters versus arguments. So what is the difference between function parameters and function arguments? Well, I'll tell you what, let me ask you a top hat question. 
So here's a function definition. So tell me, what is x? All right, I'm going to close this in just a few seconds. Lots of answers coming in. That's good. Close that one out in five, four, three, two, one, and stop. Okay, let's check out the answers. All right, so what is X here? Okay, so is it an argument, an expression, a keyword, a literal, or a parameter? And... The correct answer is that x here is a parameter. So remember, an argument is something that is a property of a function call. So if I call the print function, then a value that I pass into that print function is called a is called an argument. So good morning, and I could print one, two, three. In this case, one, two, and three are all arguments. A parameter is something that has to do with a function definition. So something, well, uh, what is a parameter as I described it last time? Right, so a parameter is a variable inside of a function, and it gets its value from an argument. So a function is a way of, in most cases, when a function takes input, a function is a way of saying, well, I want you to perform some procedure. Maybe you calculate something, maybe you print something, maybe you turn on an LED on an Arduino board, but dear computer, I want you to follow some procedure for this value x. Now I will pass you one value that you will call x, and then I'll call the function again, and I'll pass a different value that you call x. I could write a function, that would, for example, let's see. So I could write a function that will print out, or sorry, that will return, um, okay, O's. So the O's in a name. So we could have something that looks like this. And I am actually showing Thani, so well done me. Okay, there we go. So that's one way of writing this function. Um, another way of writing this function, well, actually, I would challenge you to think about uh, what's a way that I could write this function using a uh, list comprehension instead of writing it this way. Um, however, in this case, I might say, uh, let me run this in order to define the function. And then I could call, what is the OS of John? What is the OS of uh, Goose? What is the OS of Memorial? Well, it's one. So I've defined the function once, but now I can use the function as many times as I like. So, Let's see, uh, quick question. What does the exclamation mean in Python? Um, so exclamation can sometimes be used to mean not. So exclamation equals means not equals, whereas two equal signs means is equal to something. 
Okay. Uh, so yeah, in, in this case, name is a parameter. And you notice that this code never changes. So when I call the OS, the O's function, I pass different arguments in, and every time this function runs, let's run this under the debugger. And actually in the background here, let me do that. Okay, uh, so we're first going to define this function, and then we'll step into it. So I'm going to call the function. I'm going to take the value John. I'm going to pass that as an argument to the print function. And oops, I didn't step in. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I called <laughs> print John, not print O's of John. Let's try that again. Define the function, and now I take the value John, I pass it as an argument to the O's function. And now, Thani pops up this helpful little window here to show us that we have a variable inside of this function called count. But look, it's not the only variable. We also have this variable called name. Now, name contains the value John, but I didn't say anywhere inside of our function that name should contain John. No, name is the variable that, um, well, is the parameter, which is a variable, but the thing that's special about parameters is instead of assigning to them with an equal sign, we can have a value in them that just came from the uh, argument to that function. So now if I step over that, we see it counted to one, and now we have um, the character, the last character that we looked at, the count, the name, and then when I return, that function evaluates to, that function call evaluates to whatever value was returned. So hopefully that all sounds familiar. So given that we now know what is, so someone says, could you use the in keyword for that, for in uh, for e in name. Uh, so I could use the in keyword if I wanted to. So if o in name or o in name. Now that's just going to tell me is there at least one o. It's not going to tell me if there's two or three or four. But if I wanted to write a different function like does this name contain o's, then I could write that. Yep. Okay. Uh, so let me ask you a different question then. It might seem a little pedantic to keep harping on this, but this is, in fact, something that we want to be clear about. Because if we get confused about functions and our, our parameters and arguments, it will lead to further confusion down the road. So we want to be really clear. So, just tap on the argument, and there is only one in this script. All right, I'm going to close this in just a few seconds. So close this out in about five, four, three, two, one, and stop. Okay, so we have people tapped in a variety of places. So let's see. Let's walk through all of these things. So X here is... Well, what is this line? X equals 12. That is a statement. What kind of a statement is it? Who wants to say in the chat what kind of statement this is? X equals sign 12. 
That's an assignment statement. Yep. Then we define a function. So def is a keyword that means we're defining a function. Foo is the name of the function that we're defining. Then inside of parentheses, we have another x, and this is a parameter. So this is not an argument, that is a parameter. Then we've got the colon at the end, and then we, in the body of the function, we have a compound assignment statement. So x plus equals 1. That is equivalent to saying x is assigned by x equals sign x plus 1. So we take the value of x, add 1 to it, assign it back to x. Then we have a function call foo is the name of the function, parentheses, and then x. So this is the argument. So that is the only argument in this script. Okay. All right, so that's the difference between a parameter and an argument, and we want to be clear about those things. Um, so that's stuff that we talked about last time, Monday, and today we will talk about um, someone said there was print. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, you're right. Uh, yeah, print is down at the bottom. <laughs> I didn't see it there. Yes, print is also, sorry, the X passed to print is also an argument. Absolutely right. So yes, I believe that I did, in fact, mark both of those as correct. So the X passed to foo is an argument, and the X passed to print is an argument, even when I don't scroll all the way down. But yes, 100%. Uh, please, could I explain the difference again? Yep. So, uh, an argument is a value that gets passed to a function in a function call. So, remember the picture that I drew of having like a machine, where a function is a machine where it takes inputs and it, and it can produce outputs? Well, the values that we put in the machine are arguments. Uh, imagine that on the front of the machine there's a slot where you put something and then it goes into the slot and it gets processed, right? So I'm going to take uh, a raw pizza, <laughs> a pizza with uncooked dough, I'm going to put it in the slot, something happens and out the other end comes a pizza. Or I put in bread and out the other end comes out toast. Well, the thing that I put into the slot is an argument and I can put well, maybe I could put a pizza in, or I could put an English muffin in, or I could put a piece of bread in. I could put lots of different things in the slot. Whatever I put in the slot is the argument. Um, if it helps you think of it, think about in an argument, you know, you might say something to someone else. Well, I think that your position is silly because obviously uh, everybody should wear blue socks all the time. That's my argument. Well, I'm putting something into that uh, slot. I'm saying something. I am putting a value into the function. The parameter is like the slot in the machine. So it's a place where we're going to have a value. The function doesn't say, the function definition doesn't say what value goes into that slot. It just says, here is a place where you can put a value. When you give me that value, I will do something with it. I will compute with it. I will... Uh, compute what is the square root of this number or something like that. But you put whatever number in you like, and I will take it and do something with it. Or you put in whatever name you like, and I will do something with that name that you have passed in. So in the function definition, we have parameters. That's identifying here's a place to put a value, and then I will compute based on that value. The argument is the value that you actually put in. So I hope that kind of clarifies things a bit. How is argument different from value? So an argument is a value that we pass in to a function. So we have values all over the place, right? We have values stored in variables. We have uh, literal values. We have values that are expressions that give us values. So there's values all over the place. Um, an argument is a value that gets passed into a function's parameter. So it gets passed into the input of a function. All right, hopefully that's a little clearer now. All right, so today we are going to talk about scope, so a little bit more information about those parameters. We're going to talk about some special kinds of arguments, and we'll see whether or not we manage to get to recursion. All right, so uh, yeah, this is stuff that we have been talking about already. So remember, arguments are values that we pass into functions. So in this case, one would be an argument. 
the value of two plus two would be an argument. So four would be an argument. Um, and then the value of x times three, whatever x happens to be, that would be another argument, a value that we've computed that we pass into the function f. But a parameter is a variable in a function that gets initialized by an argument. So it's the slot in the machine where you put something. It's not the value that you put in which is kind of like the difference between a variable and the value that it holds, right? So I can have a variable called x, and then I can write code that increments x, or that divides by x, or does you know, lots of different things with x, without actually having to know what x is. I write a Python script that says, dear user, enter a value of x, and then I will blink the LED on my Arduino x times, whatever the value of x is. I can write that code without having to know what x is. But then when I run it, somebody actually has to put a value into x so that the code can do its thing. So that's the difference again between arguments and parameters. And within a function, parameters or any variables that we define inside of a function are local to the function. What does that mean? Well, that means that these function or these variables are separate from any other variables that we've defined in the file. So when I actually goose for all the Top Gun fans. So I'm going to run this program. I'm going to define the function first. Then we're going to go into the function. So I'm going to call this function, take the value John, pass it as an argument to the name variable. And when I do, you see this little window pops up showing us how the function called O's is being executed. We'll notice that we have a list of local variables that are only pertaining to this function call. We still have these other variables here that pertain to the whole script, but when I advance through this and I define this variable called count, you'll see that the count variable doesn't go in this big, in this list of variables, the variables, I'm doing that thing again. Okay, uh, so we go into the OS or the O's call and you'll see when I define this variable called count, it goes into this list of local variables. So it's not part of this list of variables, and when I am done running this function, this variable called count and this variable called name are actually going to disappear. So watch, I'm going to leave this function now and they're gone. It's as if they were never there. All that we're left with at the end of that function running is whatever value was returned from the function. So the function returned one, which means that we have the number one that's the result of calling the function. So that is the value that we then pass into the print function. So we print one. When I call the function again using a different argument, so I'm gonna pass the value goose this time. Well, now you see we start running the function and again, we have a local variable called name. Now it's been initialized with a different value. It's been initialized with the value goose. And then when we create this local variable called count, well, that variable is part of, or it is it is local to the current function call. It, it doesn't appear in our scripts list of variables. It's only a variable for this function. It's only a variable until this function is done being run. And once again, so we have a variable called ch, one called count, one called name. When we leave this function, all we're left with is whatever value was returned from our function. Uh, someone says, can you please repeat what return does? Uh, return, is, it's not a function, it's a statement, and the return function is how we give an output from a function. So the input comes into parameters, so an argument goes to a parameter. When the function is done, if we return a value, that is the output from the function. So inputs here, output there, the output is whatever we return. And the statement is return space or some amount of white space followed by a value. Okay, so variables are local to a function. So there's a list of variables for the whole script as it's running, or later we'll see as for a module, uh, but there's a list of variables for this script that's running, and there's a separate 
list of variables for the function and for that specific function call. So that has some implications. So for example, if we have this script uh, where I define a variable called name and I put the value John in it, then I define a function and inside of that function, whenever we run that function, we create a variable called name and I put the value foo in it and then I print name. Well, what is going to happen when we run this script? When we call the foo function, when we print the name, which name is actually gonna be printed? Let me ask you that via top hat. Now, don't forget the, uh, the name colon at the beginning here as well. So this script is going to print name colon space something. What's the something? Well, tell, tell me everything that's going to be printed. Don't forget the name colon part. All right, answers are coming in. There's a question in the meantime. Um, so can you write a function with no parameters? Yes, I certainly can. Um, A function that has no parameters um, is something that kind of already needs to know what it's going to do, but it can work with something that we'll talk about in a minute called global variables. We generally don't want to use a lot of global variables, but it can. Um, or a function could be something like, so for example, you call functions, um, or actually you may not call them in the lab, but we have functions that are called things like RGB LCD init, which says I want to set up the RGB LCD and make sure that it's initialized and make sure that it's ready to use. Well, that's a function that takes no parameters, um, but it's something that we call before you invoke other things. So that's part of like setting up the library and stuff. So yes, we can have a function with no inputs. All right, I'm going to close this now in just a couple of seconds. Let's close it out in five, four, three, two, one, and closed. All right, let's take a look at the responses. Right, okay, so the correct answer here is indeed name colon foo, because when we're inside of the function, we're going to use this local variable. So let me pop this into Thonny. And we'll see if we can visualize why this is the case. Okay, so uh, first we create a variable called name and it stores the value John. Then we define this function called foo and defining the function is its kind of like a statement. It just creates the function. It sets up the function so that we can use it later. It doesn't run the function. It just makes the function. Now we're actually going to run the function. So I step into this function. And you see we get this little separate window showing us what's happening inside the function. So when we assign the value foo into the variable name, well, that goes into a local variable. So when we go to print a variable called name, well, first of all, we're going to look inside of the function and say, do we have any local variables called name? And the answer is yes, we do. So we are going to print that. If we didn't have a local variable called name, well, then we would also look at the, the big list of variables or the list of variables for the whole script. But we're going to start by looking at our local variables. And so you see it prints the string name colon space foo. 
Um, none is showing up here in Thani. Why do we see the word none there? Where is that coming from? Right, so the function is done, but what value did this function return? So remember, when we call a function, we give inputs, and it gives an output. It returns something, right? Well, in this case, this function doesn't return anything. So that means that implicitly, the language says, well, if you don't have a return statement, if you don't return anything, we will return the special value none, which means nothing. There we go. Okay. Good. So that is um, an, an introduction to the idea of local variables. So in this case, we had two name variables. So, and those two name variables, one was for the whole script, and one was just for a single function call. Not even for every call to that function, but just for a single function call. And that uh, variable had separate memory from the other variable that was also called name. They had separate memory, which means they could store separate values. So uh, what's this script going to do? And in fact, I think I have a top hat question for this one too. I do. So I will show it to you. What does this script output? So again, we've got two variables with the same name, both x in this case. There's one defined kind of at the top level of the script, and then there's another one that is created inside of a function when we call the function. So what's this going to output? All right, I'm going to give this one just a few more seconds. All right, let's close this one out in five, four, three, two, one, and stop. Okay, so the correct answer in this case is all right, most people got this one. Good, it's 12. And the reason is because when we call the foo function, the foo function will, and when we go inside this foo function and call, it will assign the value 13 to a variable, but the variable it will assign the number 13 to is a local variable called x. When we leave the function, that local variable, poof, it's just gone, it disappears, which means that we didn't change the value in this x. So this x still has whatever value it was before, which is 12. So I hope that is clear. And it seems that most people got that one, so that's good. Um, it is possible if we want to change a global variable, if we want to change a variable that's not local to a function, but that's global to a whole file, we can do that. If we want to do that, we have to just use a, a Python keyword called global. So we can say, I want to use this global variable x, which means when we execute this statement, we're not referring to a local variable called x. Instead, we're referring to the global variable called x. That is something we rarely ever want to do. Global variables are, generally speaking, kind of a bad idea. It's a really good thing to be able to encapsulate 
a little bit of logic with some data in a function and keep it separate from everything else so that when the function is done, we know that we haven't caused a bunch of side effects that we're not aware of, etc. We haven't accidentally assigned to the wrong variable that we didn't mean to assign to. It's kind of nice to know that when the function is done, it's just done, it's gone, and we don't have to think about it anymore. And that helps us to reason about the correctness of programs. So we want to minimize our use of global variables. They do have a place, but basically as little as possible. And I'm not sure if in the course of this course, you will ever need to use a global variable like that. Okay, uh, so that's local versus global variables. Um, and yeah, that uh, spent a little more time on that than I was banking on, but that's okay, that's okay. We will get to some of the other things that I thought we might talk about another time. Let me leave you with one last top hat question here. Where's the syntax error here? There's something wrong with this script or with this function definition, I should say. And let me scroll and make sure there's no more script. Yeah, there isn't. Uh, there's a question here. So when defining a function like this, like the one that I have in Thani, for example, um, what's this final foo used for? Is that used to close the function? No, that's not used to close the function. Um, the, I could have this and it would be perfectly valid by itself. The only thing is that in this, if I define a function called foo, but I never call it, then it'll never run, which means it'll never kind of show us anything. Um, so, I mean, the function call could much, come much later, right? Let's call eh, foo, and then I call foo, right? So I could do it like that, and that would be fine. Um, but yeah, so the, the function definition starts at def and ends wherever we stop indenting. Just like an if statement starts with if, condition colon, and then there's an indented body and it ends wherever all the indentation ends. So, good question though. All right, people are just about done answering this, so I'm gonna close this one out in five, four, three, two, one, and close it. All right, so let's have a look and yeah, okay. Almost everybody had the right answer, which is that the syntax error is that missing colon. So we have def, an identifier, parenth parameters in parentheses, followed by a colon. And in this case, the colon was just missing, which means that, uh, that the Python interpreter would have said, sorry, zero, it's all completely wrong, even though other stuff was right. But that is the price that we pay for having a, an artificial language like mathematics, which allows us to be really precise and terse. Okay, so I will hold it there for today and we'll finish some additional things that I wanna say about functions. We'll talk about those on Friday, but that's okay. We're, we're doing pretty well for time in this particular semester. So if anyone has any other questions, so if you have an individual question about your specific assignment one or two, do drop me an email if you haven't already. If you've sent me an email already and I haven't responded yet, um, it's just because I'm still <laughs> working through a list. Um, and I am going to revisit the auto grader for assignment two to fix it because it is right now it's doing things. I mean, for lots of people, it was fine. It was absolutely fine. Lots of people got the full marks and it was great. Um, but there definitely are instances in which the auto grader is wrongly disregarding one Unicode representation of a green square versus another one, and that's wrong. So the auto grader is demonstrably incorrect, and so I will figure out why it's doing that, and I will fix it. Uh, for assignment one, there are places where the auto grader is not wrong to demand that you use exactly a particular string, but it does seem a little harsh to take off those points for every single test that I do. So I'm going to go back and revisit that one as well. So if your issue on assignment one or two is either of those things, you can still send me an email so that I have a list of everybody who's affected. Um, but hang tight, there will be some kind of a redress coming there. Okay. Um, so let's see. So the in keyword is only used to check if something is in something iterable. When it is used 
um, as an operator in an expression, yes. So we can use the in keyword just as part of the syntax of like a for loop. Um, that use of the keyword in is a little different from using it in the sense of, so if I say O in John, that is an expression and that checks, it's a, um, so in that case, in is a binary operator that checks to see whether the thing on the left is in the thing on the right. Um, it's a binary operator in the same way that like true and false, well, and is a binary operator. It takes two operands and it performs some operation and the whole thing evaluates to a value. Well, that is, or, 42 is less than 100. Well, less than is a binary operator with two operands and it checks to see something and it evaluates to, this whole expression evaluates to a value, which in this case is true and in that case was true. Okay, uh, so said, do we email you through Brightspace or with your email? Yeah, so as I mentioned in the course outline, um, I do sometimes check the Brightspace email, but you know everything about Brightspace is, it's kind of like the internet, but worse. <laughs> it's email, but worse, and it's web pages, but worse, and every it's kind of like technologies that we've been working on for 60 years, but just a little bit worse. Uh, so I do occasionally check my Brightspace email, but you'll get a, a faster response if you send me just an email at my regular email address, which is in the course outline. All right. Well, we will call that enough for today and uh, hope you have a lovely rest of your day and we'll chat again on Friday.